We want to take you through the Bible now in 2 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. We want to look at this text of scripture and uh, examine the things that are written here for us. And we are looking at material that is familiar. And we looked at this episode from a different perspective last week. Uh, now we're looking at it from the book of Chronicles. And we looked at Kings last week. We look at it from the chronicle, uh, the chronicler's standpoint. I want you to know that what we're studying is a period of dedication. It's in the midst of the dedication of the temple. Solomon dedicated the house of God. And as he dedicated the house of God and he prayed about the house of God and he asked the Lord's favor, the Lord in turn responded to Solomon. The Lord in turn responded to Solomon and in the words that he used, uh, he gave a clear description uh, of the dynamic between God and God's people, between God and man. The words that we read today, they point to the reality of the feebleness of men in pursuit of a constantly faithful walk before God. Uh You mean Solomon prayed that God's favor would hit the people in the midst of the people and their weakness in the midst of the people coming to him and seeking his face. Uh And the Lord responded in a favorable way. Just thinking about the feebleness of humans trying to live before God. Just thinking about the weakness of man trying to live before the Lord Uh makes me think about a song that we sing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Just a closer walk with thee. Uh Granted, Savior is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord. Let it be. There's always a need for you and me to be refreshed. There's always a need for you and me to be reinvigorated. There's always a need for you and me to be renewed. You see, when church attendance is down and church delinquency is up, we need to be renewed. Not only that, but when peace is eroding, And gossip is growing. We need renewal. Not only that, when trust is slipping and uh, rumors are spreading, we need renewal. But not only that, when the Bible reading is slipping and Christian morals are dipping, we need to have renewal. And so this message is about renewal. It is about you and me getting uh, reinvigorated, being refreshed, being revived, being to the point where we can walk with the Lord in a faithful way, consistently, so that we can truly mean it when we sing, my God and I walk through the world together, my God and I. It's something that we're not just singing, but something that we're living. It's one thing to say something. It's another thing to experience something. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to walk about it. We need then to be renewed. So I want to speak to you about being re-energized for the Lord. I want to focus our attention from both an individual perspective and a collective perspective perspective. I want to use as a topic, renewing God's people. Look at the words of second Chronicles seven and verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is the promise of God that he gave to Solomon and it's an enduring promise to you and to me today. Renewing God's people if 
my people which are called by my name. Let me tell you, there's something in a name. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. There is something in a name. A name uh, implies ownership. Listen to what God said again. If my people that are called by my name, name implies and defines ownership. When God spoke these words to Solomon, he was reminding his people who they belong to. He was reminding them that as opposed to belonging to the various heathen gods that they knew about, they instead believe in the God of heaven. They instead believe in the one true God. This is what God was indicating. We must remember what being a Christian is all about. Being a Christian is not simply wearing a title. Being a Christian is not simply saying some words. Being a Christian is not about feeling good because you got jazzed up by a Christian song. Being a Christian means one that actually belongs to Jesus Christ. One that is owned by Jesus Christ. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. but Christ lives in me and the life that I live now in the flesh I don't live by myself but I live by the power by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself to me don't you ever treat Christianity as something as simple as going to a party and going back home Don't you ever treat it as something that you throw on and take off anytime you get ready. When you talk about being a Christian, you are saying, and I am saying, that I have given myself voluntarily to the Lord who died for me. And that's not really saying a whole lot because we don't even have ourselves to give. God gave us life in the first place. What we are doing when we become a Christian is we are coming back to the one who got us started in the first place. Back to our origin. We're like Adam coming back to the garden to receive God's eternal blessing. And so being a Christian is being one that belongs to Christ. And therefore, if any man suffers, Let him suffer as a Christian. Let him not be ashamed of that name because a name means something. And one of the things a name means is it means ownership. But not only that, name means relationship. Listen to God again. If my people that are called by my name, what are you saying, Father? I'm saying, first of all, I own the people. Not only that, I'm saying, secondly, I'm in a relationship with the people. If you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that God made a covenant with the nation of Israel. What is a covenant? Well, a covenant is a bond in blood that has been sovereignly administered. What am I saying? A covenant costs something. A covenant costs something. And it comes to the New Testament, the covenant of the New Testament costs the blood of Jesus Christ. No wonder Jesus talks about this through the great writer in the book of Hebrews. He said, you don't want the blood of bulls and goats, but a body I have prepared, you prepared, and he gave that life. When you think about the crucifixion of Jesus, think about it from the standpoint of a covenant that is me. It is a bond in blood. You can't have a testament without the death of the testator. Jesus gave his blood to purchase us. When you talk about being redeemed, you are saying that God owns me again, and that is a relationship. Name means relationship. It is a covenantal relationship. Therefore, we must be intentional and clear in our claim to be Christians. We must be intentional and clear in our claim to be a part of the church of Christ. We're talking about relationship. Too many people run around and they talk about a title. And I can't stand it when I hear folk talk about a title. I'm a church of Christ. You ain't a church of Christ. You are in relationship. 
with the Christ yeah. who gave himself to you, yeah. gave himself for you, gave himself for me. We're not talking about wearing a title. You see, whenever you hear Brown talk about the Church of Christ, I'm not talking about a denomination. Let me say it again. When you hear me talk about Church of Christ, I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm talking about people who have been called out of the world. That's what church means. And they have been called into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you see on the sign Church of Christ, that means something. That doesn't mean my church better than yours church. It means I belong to Jesus. I'm in a relationship with Jesus and therefore I wear his name. That's what it means. That's how I understand it. That's what I'm saying. When you see Westview Church of Christ, don't you go around and say, oh, that's some denomination. That's a chip off of the other blocks. Simply People that belong to Christ. And we need to start talking about it in that way instead of the way we generally talk about it. People that belong to Christ. People that belong to Christ. When we talk then about name, name implies relationship. Remember that Israel wore the name, but she wouldn't live with the life. We can't be people. That wear the name, but don't live the life. We've got to be people that really consider ourselves in a covenant relationship with the Lord. When you become a member of the church of Christ, you have married yourself to the Lord himself. He's coming back for a church without spot or without wrinkle. It's the bride of Christ. It's a relationship. When you become a Christian, you are marrying the Lord as it were. You are becoming a part of the bride of Christ. And therefore, we got to understand that it's not just wearing a title. It is using a descriptive term. I am in a relationship with the Lord through baptism, which was the how I got into the spiritual body. We have been married to Christ. Let's not be like Israel. Even when Solomon prayed this prayer and the Lord answered, the Lord already knew that the nation of Israel married him and was at the altar with him and said, I do, but then left out with the janitor. (laughs) Marry the Lord. And went home with Baal. All right. Come on now. Come on. Marry the Lord. Amen. And went home with Dagon. Yeah. Marry the Lord. And went home with Moloch. Right. Marry the Lord. And went home with all these other pagan gods. Yeah. Yeah. But yet she married the Lord. Right. She wore the name. Yeah. But she went home. With somebody else. Now, you know, brethren, that you wouldn't like that. If you jumped the broom with the spouse you have and she went home with the janitor. She went home with the best man. You know, we'd have to come down here to the Huntsville jail and bail you out. Because no man is going to take that. And what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. You know good and well, sister, you jump the broom and he going home with Susie Q. You jump the broom, he going home with Sally. You jump the broom, he going on with somebody else. You know good and well you wouldn't take that. But what would make us think God would take that? When we took his name and implies relationship, we must remember that there's something in a name because name implies relationship. But then name also defines identity. God said if my people that are called by my name. Name implies and defines identity. Remember this when you say I'm a part or I'm a member of the church of Christ. Remember that you're talking about identity. I am identified with Christ. I am a part 
yes. of the body of Christ. Yes. I belong yes, to Christ. On, I'm in union with Christ. For those of you that are getting concerned these days and you're saying, well, I don't want to wear mm, the title, uh, rather the descriptive term Church of Christ anymore. I don't want to wear that because it has too much negativity to it. We ought to change the name. Let me tell you, you don't need to change the name. You need to change the behavior. Amen. Need to change the reputation. If there's been arrogance before, supply humility. If there's been ugliness before, bring sweetness. If there has been duplicity before, bring honesty. Let the reputation be known by the behavioral change. One thing about reputation, it can be changed with consistent living. And that's what we can do. I want to change the name. I want to be known as Sweetwater. No, no. I want to be known as Down in the Valley. No, no. I want to be known as Handshake. No, no. I want to be known as Glory Way. I want to be known as blah, blah, blah. I don't want to wear that name Church of Christ because it's, it's got a bad reputation. Well, remember, the folk can fix it. Yes, sir. Well, well. By living like Jesus calls us to live. Amen. By living, acting, speaking, treating folk the way God tells us to treat them. No problem with the name. The problem is with the behavior. And the behavior can be changed. And thank God, the behavior can be changed. I've done some bad things in my life. Things that I'm not proud of. You've done some bad things in your life. Things that you're not proud of. But I never went down to the court to change my name. I just simply got back in gear with the right behavior. I don't need to change my name. Mama and daddy gave me that name. Called me by my first name. Gave me my middle name. Gave me the last name. And even when I've done things I wished I hadn't have done, when I changed my behavior, I didn't have to go down and say, well, get my social security number and change the name connected. I don't have to do that. Just a change in behavior. Change in behavior. Wife, your husband acting a fool. Oh, Lord, I need some help here. And he's not getting his act together. And you want him to change and, and things. You don't have to run down and change your name. Come on, Michael. Let the Lord change his behavior. And you'll be happy to wear that name. Oh, I knew I would need some help on that one. Whoa, uh, husband, your wife's not acting right. And you want to send her to the court to change her name? Now, why don't you just encourage her by the Bible and the scriptures, the spirit to change behavior. And then you don't have to spend any money. <laughs> because it's cheaper. Y'all know the rest. And so we need to change behavior. So name means something. And God said, if my people that are called by my name. And then he started talking about behavior. Listen to this verse as we go a little bit further. Not only is there something in a name, but there's a constant need for humility. Listen to the book of God. We're looking at it right here in verse number 14, where the Bible talks about if my people that are called by my name, says God. And then he goes on and he says, I want them to do something. I want them to humble themselves. Oh, we need humility. There's always a need for humility. Only the humble can truly pray. The Lord said, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves. What does it mean to humble yourself and pray? You see, praying is pointing back to humility. If they would humble themselves and pray, it only the humble can truly pray. It takes humility to admit wrong. It takes humility to say, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. It takes humility to own up yes. to what you've done wrong. God was saying, I want my people to humble themselves. Yes, what is a part of that humbling? Pray. Yes. What does it mean here? That the idea is being willing to do what it takes and admit wrong to maintain the right relationship. Yes. 
Now we can understand this yeah. in our human to human relationships. Let me use the word covenant again. We understand the need here for humility in our human to human covenant. Now you have to go back to marriage again. It takes humility to say I'm wrong. But yet we have to say I'm wrong sometimes because there's been a breach in the human to human covenant. Oh, y'all don't want to help me with this. You start fussing around the house, beating your chest like Tarzan, king of the jungle. You start being great King Kong and talking about it's your way or the highway. But then if you want to have the relationship corrected, you better come off of that tree. Take off that ape suit and act like you got some sense and be willing to say, I was wrong. Maybe I was wrong. I said X. I meant it when I said it, but I was wrong in my thinking. And not only do I wish I hadn't said it, but I'm going to be working and letting the Lord work in me not to say it again. I was wrong. We understand that in our human to human covenant. You see, when we get into a covenant with one another, whether it be marriage or members of the same congregation, that is a human to human relationship. And sometimes because we are flawed, because we are fallen, we do things to step on one another's feet. But if my people that are called by my name humble themselves and pray in our human to human relationships that means admitting I'm wrong well if we can say that and understand it in our human to human covenant then our divine to human covenant requires the same thing oh it takes humility to admit wrong God is never wrong we might be wrong. Stone and I, in our human to human relationship, can both be wrong. And therefore, both need to be willing to say, I'm sorry. But when it comes to our divine to human relationship, you and me and God, God is never wrong. So if anybody needs to come back and say, I'm sorry, it's you and it's me. And this is part of what God was saying to Israel. He said, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray, when do they need to pray, Lord, when they do wrong? That's what you read in the dedicatorial statements of Solomon. Lord, when your people are wrong, when they sin, Lord, we have to recognize that when it comes to our human to divine relationship, you and I must always be willing to admit our wrong before God. Well, I never met any wrong. I'm a perfect Christian. Well, you a lying Christian is what you are. First John chapter number one. If any man sin, yes, he can come to the Lord and ask the Lord, confess, and the Lord will forgive. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You've heard this before, the word confess, as used over there in 1 John chapter 1 in the chapter 2 is the Greek word homo legeo. Homo meaning the same. Uh, legeo to say. The thought is when you and when I sin against God, we need to confess, i.e. we need to simply say, Lord, I have sinned. I'm saying about my behavior what you say about it. Yes, sir. Right. You know why David was a man after God's own heart? It wasn't because he was perfect. No, sir. Oh, it was because when he was confronted with the word of God to tell him he was wrong, he didn't make excuses. No, he, didn't. Right. he didn't back up and say, well, you know, my, my, my wives, they, they, they didn't have on enough perfume. <laughs> And Bathsheba had on more. Come on now. Or she wore my favorite. Yeah. Uh, or she played my, 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 my favorite meal. <laughs> or she shouldn't have been outside bathing naked. Yeah. Or this, that, or the other. He never said that. He simply said, I am the man. Yeah. You know what God wants out of us in our relationship with him as his people? 
You know what he wants us to do? He wants us to be humble enough to pray and say, Lord, I am the man. I am the woman. We sing it. I have sinned against you, Lord. I admit that I've done wrong. I'm just like the prodigal son. Now I'm on my way back home. I'm down on bended knee, begging you to save this soul of mine. Please forgive me and try me one more time. We need to be willing to say to God on a daily basis, Father, I have sinned and I'm coming before you in humility. I'm not making any excuses. I'm admitting that what you said about me I agree with. I say the same thing you say. You knew, you saw, you heard me lie. Lord, I lied. I'm not making any excuses. I'm not going with Lord. I I had to say something because I I didn't want somebody to get mad at me. Mm. No, just say the same thing. Call it what he calls. (laughs) You got a problem with lust? Come on. Your eyes came out of your face Come on, <laughs> like you an old Tex Avery cartoon, yeah. a wolf. Yeah. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Admit it, Lord. Yeah. I got caught up yes, sir. or better stated, that I let myself yes, sir. get caught up. Right. I looked and I didn't turn away. Amen. Lord, forgive me. Yeah. I'm saying what you said yes, sir. about me. This is what confession is all about. Look, folk, if it's good in marriage all right. to keep things going, yeah. it's even better all right. in our relationship with the Lord. Yeah. If it's good in friendships to keep the friendship going, it's even better yeah. in our relationship with the Lord. If my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and then there's a second thing he talks about here, and that is the idea of seeking the Lord's face. Let me let you know that only the humble will seek the Lord's face. Yeah. Right. Right. See, those that are humble will know that there's no other help All right. than God. You remember this verse, I will look to the hills from which cometh my strength. My help comes from the Lord. My help doesn't come from the hills. It comes from the one who made the hills. My help doesn't come from the mountain. It comes from the one who made the mountain. My help comes from the Lord. We must understand that it takes humility to recognize there is no other help we can find except the one who found us. This is what it means to be humble, to seek the Lord's face, the only one who can give us genuine peace of soul in this life is the one who called us into relationship with him. Was well, not it Jesus who said, as recorded in Matthew chapter number 11, verses 28 through 30, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Rest doesn't come from Excedrin or Tylenol. Rest doesn't come from the uh, weed store. Rest doesn't come from the latest self-help books or television programs. Rest only comes from the Lord. Jesus said, I will give you rest. Not Dr. Phil. Certainly not Dr. Oz. Not Oprah. No. Not Gail. No. no TV program. No meditation book written by some man. No ism. No best friend. No beauty salon. No barbershop. The only one who can give us true peace of mind is Jesus. He said, take my yoke upon you. You and I can never have rest unless we come to Jesus and then put his yoke on us. We got to put his yoke on us. He won't force it on us. He won't grab you by the neck and wrap that yoke around you. He says, here it is. Put this on you. Why, Lord? You want your soul to be at peace? Put this on you. Why, Lord? Because the way you've been acting, you're the one caused your mess. Yes, sir. Put this on you. Yes, sir. Why, Lord? You need somebody to control you. Yeah. Why, 
Lord, because you need somebody who will guide you and direct you in a loving manner. Put this on you. Take my yoke upon you. And you know what? Learn of me. As I'm teaching you while you have that yoke on you, you want to pull to the left and I pull you. Yeah. Just a little bit Come on, man. to get you to turn in the right direction. Oh, you go to the right, you're off into some weeds. I pull you so, ever so gently to get you to go in the right direction. Put my yoke upon you and learn to me. How do I learn from you? From the study and the practice of the inspired word of God. Learn from me for I am meek and lowly in heart. I won't be beating you upside your head. Yeah. I'm meek and I'm lowly in heart. And you shall, not might, you shall find rest unto your soul. You've heard before that word soul from the Greek suke. The idea we get our English words about psychology and psychiatrists and we spend all that money for that stuff. Jesus said, I'm giving this to you. I'll give you rest for your suke. You don't need all this foolishness in the world. I'll give you rest. I'll let you sleep at night. Come on, man. I'll let you be at peace with other people. Doesn't even matter if they act a fool. Yes, the way I'm working with you daily, you shall find rest. Only the humble will recognize that the only way to have peace is to be with the Prince of Peace. You can never find it any other place. And so God says, if my people that are called by money, Humble themselves. Yeah. Pray. Right. Seek my face. What are you doing, Lord? I'm telling you how to have a great life. Yeah. Not in the sense of getting what you want, yeah. but in the sense of walking with me yeah. and having life that's really worth living. Yes, Can I tell you, only by following the teachings of Christ will any of our lives ever make sense. Right, It'll never make sense following any other thing. Right. It's got to be the teachings of Jesus. Yeah. They and they alone direct our steps right. and direct our lives. And then we need to understand that we need to be humble or be humbled. Well, well. Either we will humble ourselves huh. or be humbled. Yeah. Either we will humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord yeah. or he will humble us. Yeah. This is a lesson we learn from God's old covenant people. Their continued rebellion against God caused their continued punishment and misery. This is the story of the 40 years of wilderness wandering. Those people could have been in the promised land in just a few days. But because of their rebellion and their unwillingness to be humble, they had to march in the wilderness for 40 years. Grandma and grandpa never got into the promised land. These folk were too hard-headed and too stubborn and their bodies died in the wilderness because they would not humble themselves. All they wanted to do is get mad at Moses. Get mad at Aaron. You know how some Christians do? Always got a problem with somebody. Typically those in the front. Always got a problem. Complaining, arguing. Moses, uh, he think he the only one heard from God. Uh-huh. Put a cord in the meter here. Oh, I get tired of people, uh, preacher, think he the only one to know the Bible. Mm. Come on, man. Never said it. Come on. You ought to know it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anybody can get up there and do that. Yeah, you try it. <laughs> you try it. <laughs> anybody can talk out of the side of their neck. Yeah. Yeah. Y- y'all notice I said side of the neck. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody can get up here with the gift of gab, but it's a task to interpret and exegete scripture and communicate it in such a way where it can be applicable and practice in day to day living. And the fruit is to see the change in the people's eyes. Any other thing is just talking. Any other thing is just talking and saying, show me the spotlight. Mm, on, There's a difference between that yeah. and seeking to feed the people. Yeah. And so those folks in the wilderness died. Yeah. The ones that came out of Egypt right. as adults. Yeah. 
Because they would not humble themselves. Either humble yourself or be humbled. This is the story of the book of Judges. Yes, you read the book of Judges, the people are getting along well, but then they go rebel. Right. And God gives them over to an enemy. Yes, and they get whooped. Right. Sometimes 20 years, 26 years, 40 years. Come on, and God raises up a judge. Yeah. And the judge comes in and they win. And then they're all right for a little while. And then off they go again. Yes, and God sends them back under the yoke of another bondage. Right. And they cry, Lord, we're in trouble. Here's another judge. Get free. Oh, we act a fool. All right, here you go back again. All, right. all throughout the book of Judges. Either humble yourself or be humbled. But not only that, this is the story of the northern kingdom kingdom. Yeah. After Solomon's reign, his son Rehoboam took his place yeah. and the nation split under Rehoboam. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom kept on rebelling against God. So in 722 BC, God sent a Syria over there and defeated and destroyed and eliminated the northern tribes. And therefore the statement is still the same. Either humble yourself or be humble. Amen. But then this goes again. Yes, sir. The southern kingdom rebelled against God over and over again. Amen. And in 586, God sent Babylonians over there and they sacked Jerusalem, burned down the city, destroyed the walls, raided the temple, burned the temple, took the people over in captivity, and they stayed there for 70 long years. And all of that is to say, either humble yourself or be humbled. Amen. I'm afraid when it comes to this country today. Come on. We either humble ourselves or we will be humbled. Uh, we need to hear that message. Somebody say, oh, it's a terrible election season coming up. It's more than that. Terrible election season in 2024. It'll be worse than you think. If folk don't act right. Well, we're the mighty America. Never lost a war. Well, that's a lie. Go check out Vietnam. All right. You'll see there was a tail whooping put on a mighty nation by folk who learned how to do guerrilla warfare. Yeah. Made France go home, right. sent us home. Yeah. You don't like that one? Go back further then right. in history. Right. You'll find other great wars we were in. Didn't come back so great. Yes, Somebody says, well, it'll never happen again. I don't know about that. Right. Come on now. There is a God yes, sir. who has the ability yes, sir. to light chess pieces, move one nation out of power, put another one in its place. There was the great Babylonian nation. It was great. But God brought up the Median Persian yes, Empire, moved them out the way. Right. Median Persian Empire was great. God woke up Greece yeah. brought Alexander the Great to Greece come through, Greece. take over the power. Oh, great Grecian nation, Hellenistic nation. Yeah. Oh, God woke up Rome, Rome yes, had them come over there and take Greece out of the yes, way. Grow on power, on power. God brought the Huns over, yeah. knocked them off the yeah. perch over and over again throughout world history. God has a power to say, I'm moving you out of the way because you're too arrogant. Yes, sir. And I'm putting somebody else in your place. Yeah. Who's to say his hand's not on America? Yeah. 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 And shift us over to someplace else. On, the great eagle yeah. may be dead. Yes, well, well. Because if you don't humble yourself, Amen. you will be humbled. Yes, God said it, my people, that are called by my name if they humble themselves, if they pray, if they seek my face. But then he said something else. And there is something in the fact that there's no renewing without repenting. God says they need to turn from their sin. Turn from their wickedness. Turn from their wicked ways. Did you notice the word that came right after that? Then, uh -huh. if my people All right. that are called by money, All right. if they humble themselves, yeah. if they pray and seek my face and turn yeah. from their wicked ways, right. then yeah. I'll come in All right. and do some stuff good for them. But there's a word before the then. 
The word is they need to turn from their wicked ways. There is no renewing without reforming. No renewing without repentance. This text sits at a powerfully important point in Israel's history. When that temple was dedicated, God already knew what was going to happen. When Solomon said his last amen, when all the people went home, the Lord knew what was happening. It wasn't long after that that Solomon fell into serving false gods. He married foreign women and his wives led his heart away to serving other gods. Brethren, you can't do everything any wife tells you to do. You better check it in the word. Oh Lord, I need some help again. (laughs) Same thing applies for the sisters. Yes, the husband is the head of the wife, but he needs to be stepping in God's direction. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. That's all right. I'm going to do everything he tells me. You better not do anything all right. that takes you outside of God's way. Yeah. Mm. The wife, uh, uh, yes, you need to be submissive to your husband. But don't submit to the point where you're doing wrong. All right. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Husband, you need to love your wife. Amen. But don't love her to the point where you follow her doing wrong. All right. Amen. Amen. You see what I'm saying? There's three in that relationship. Right. You, her, and God. Yes, sir. Right. Who's right? God. God. He's right. He's right all the time. Yeah. And when you go against him to please her or to please him, you turn God off. Yes. Guess I better move on. Come on, brother. That's good. That's good. There is no renewing without reforming. Solomon let his wives take him away in the false gods. Not only that, the nation after that was split. All right. You had the northern tribes and the southern tribes. Not only that, the two resulting nations would be taken captive. All right. Yet the Lord promised to heal the land yes, sir. Mm-hmm. on the condition of repentance, yes, sir. on the condition of reform, yes. on the condition of them confessing their sin and changing their way. Yes. God doesn't want us just to say I'm wrong. He wants us to change. Yes, sir. Yeah, amen. Lord, I'm wrong. Yes, I'm glad you admit it. Yes, sir. And I see the sincerity of your heart. Now let me see what you're going to do. All right. Mm-hmm. You know what John the Baptist told those individuals that came to his baptism? Mm-hmm. They were, they were, they were some, some, some funky acting folk. Mm-hmm. You remember that? Yeah. They came to him and John said, you brood of snakes. who warned you from the wrath to come you first bring forth fruit worthy of repentance in other words don't show up here at church and you know you're not going to act right grinning in folks face knowing good and well you have no intention to live the right way don't get in the Lord's pulpit yeah. And have no intention on practicing what you preach. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Come on, brother. We let that mess go on too long. Yes, sir. Oh, this brother's smooth. Yeah. He says the right rhyme. He gets on the roll. Yeah. He whoops and drips. He got all that going on. Yeah. And yet don't consider his personal life. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Well, well, well. Yeah, he's running three and four women. But we don't want to say anything because, oh, he sure can preach. There's a need to do and say. Jesus began to do and teach. You don't need perfection in the pulpit, but you need honesty and folk consistently striving to live right. Not concerned about living right. I got no use for you. All right, brother. Come on. Brown brings so and so over from X Y Z part of the country. Yeah. Man, he show sure can preach. Yeah. If I don't know him, I'm going to first ask, hmm, "What's he live like?" Yes, sir. That's right. Right. What's he live like? That's right, brother. You don't need to worry about that. Oh yeah, I do. Yes, sir. <laughs> what he live like? How's he live? Right. Well, I, I don't know. Well, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we need to think about what happened. There cannot be blessing if there's not reform. Yes, sir. If there's not repentance, yes. the promise of God still applies today to renew us. If you really want to get your life together, be serious about repentance. Yes, Amen. Was not a Jesus who said in Luke 13, three and five, yes. I tell you, no, right. except you repent, right. you will perish just like those people you came to tell me yes. about. There needs to be reform. You see, God cannot continue to bless us if we continue to rebel. You see, when we think about what the Bible teaches in Romans chapter six, verses one through four, the gospel must be responded to if you've never responded to it. In order to receive God's favor. People all over Huntsville want peace of mind, Uh want a better life, want to have a a, a heart that's not keeping them uh, in disturbance. But you can't have it without repenting and having your sins washed away in the waters of baptism. When I get tired of you preachers always talking about baptism. I have to talk about it because that's the only place where you get your sins washed away. I have to talk about it because that's the only way you get married to Jesus. I have to talk about it. That's the only way you receive the Holy Spirit. I got to talk about it. It's not my will. It's God's will that you get wet, buried in water. For the forgiveness of your sins. And that's how you get in your relationship with the Lord. You rise to walk in a newness of life. New in terms of quality, not in terms of time. New in terms of quality means I don't care how long this product's been on the market, this stuff still works. I don't need new and improved. It's good when they made it. It's still good now. It's 70 years old. Still works. Good in terms of quality. New in terms of quality. And then we must understand, even as Christians, we tie the Lord's hand to bless us when we don't turn from sinful behavior. Sometimes we ask the Lord to bless us. Lord, please bless me. Please bless me. Renew in me a new heart. All right, spirit, Lord, help me. Bless me. But we're going to hold on to our dirt. God can't bless us if we won't let go of our sinful ways. Is he unable? No, he is unwilling. And in a sense, he is unable in that he will never contradict himself. God won't let sin go in you or in me. Because if he did, he'd have to let it go in the devil. If I keep doing the wrong thing and I know I'm doing the wrong thing, and I know God is displeased, but I keep on doing the wrong thing. I tie God's hands, if you will, from blessing my life. Because if he blesses my life and I keep on doing the wrong thing, and I, yeah, Lord, I'm still doing it wrong. And I keep, yeah, I'm still, I know you see me. And I keep doing it wrong. And he lets me go. He got to let the devil go. And if that's the case, close, close up hell. Nobody going. Because if you let one go, you got to let them all go. Or you stop being just. But God is a righteous God and he's willing to favor us and bless us and refresh us and renew us and re-energize us and reinvigorate us if we turn from our wicked ways. And so let me close with this. And I think this is a text of scripture that we really need to hear and hear with the right spirit. I'm in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony 
of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the son of God underfoot counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sacrificed a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. If you spend your life continuing, if I spend my life continuing to willfully live my way uh-huh. and forget God's way uh-huh. and expect him mm-hmm. to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Mm. I am fooling myself and you are fooling yourself. But if my people who are called by my name, Uh name means something. Uh If they will humble themselves, oh, the humble Uh will confess their sins. The humble will pray. The humble will seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. If you're serious about God, you and I will daily check ourselves out and turn our feet out of the wrong path. Yes, sir. Then God says, I will forgive their sins. Yes. I will heal their land. Amen. Remind you something I tried to say to you last week. The problem with America isn't Americans. Right. The problem in America is the church. Uh-huh. We got too many churches in America to have so much foolishness Uh happening in this country. If we were really being the church, Uh you wouldn't have to worry about all the foolishness taking place politically, Uh taking place in neighborhoods and violence and activities like this. It's not the world that's sick. We know it's sick. I think the church is sick. Yes, sir. Well, well. And when the church gets better, we can be a part of the healing of the land. And so renewing God's people. Church, be a people that wears God's name proudly. Be a people that is always willing to humble itself. Be a people always willing to turn from its wicked ways. Uh Be a people who receives God's favor and the world, the land right here in this city will be greatly blessed. If you're not a child of God, why not today? Why not come to the Lord? You need him. You walked away from him. I wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The path of sin too long I've trod. Now I'm coming home. Come down the aisle and say, I believe Jesus is the son of God and we'll baptize you into Christ today. Away will be all of your past sins. Given to you will be the gift of the Holy Spirit. Sin will be washed away as far as the east is from the west. If you can count the stars in the sky, then you will know God's blessing of forgiving your sins. But since you can't even count those, just be grateful that he washes them all away. Yes, you can come today. And we beg you to come right here and right now as we stand together and sing a song of encouragement, we ask you to come forward to be baptized. Mm-hmm.